<laughs> okay. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'll be talking about random graphs. And uh, random graphs are a way to think about the real world around us because many things are organized in terms of networks. Think about social networks, but also citation networks. There are many, many, many examples of networks that play a profound role in our daily lives. And the question is how to model those. And the question then is, what are properties of these complex networks? What are the phenomena that we see in the real world? And how can we understand these on the basis of models? Already a very profound question is, what is a good model? And that's the kind of questions that I'll be addressing uh, here. This is, uh, let's say, the result of a long line of research, and there will be some results coming up here and there. But what I'll try to do is basically explain the, the philosophy in this field starting with the application. So this is a structure, it's slightly different from the abstract on the internet. I'll start by discussing some real world networks and random graph models for them, very basic random graph models. Then I'll talk about the small world phenomena in such random graph models and how they are related to the kind of phenomena that we see in real world networks. Um, and in the third lecture, I'll talk about information diffusion in random graphs. Um, sometimes also called first passage percolation, and we already heard, or you have already heard, uh, a course about this by, uh, by Ganesh. And uh, the, the questions that I'll be addressing uh, are going to be slightly related. All right, so where is the material taken from? Well, I'm in the process of writing books. It's actually pretty difficult writing books in an area that moves so quickly. It's sort of like shoot, trying to shoot a, a moving target. Um, the, the very first book has come out. It's very basic. It basically describes some of the uh, really simple properties of the, the network models that we're, we're encountering. But it also tries to explain a little bit what the philosophy is be, behind network science. And I will also say a little bit more about that. So not just the kind of problems that we tend to ask, but even the kind of problems that practitioners using random graphs uh, are trying to address. Um, at the same time, I'm writing a volume two. This is basically at master student level. In fact, the, uh, the origin and the philosophy of the, of the book comes from a course that we've been teaching in Eindhoven University uh, for quite a long time. Um, and in volume two, it's a little bit more advanced topics, like the topic that uh, Kavita was talking about, local weak convergence, plays a prominent role there. It really is uh, still in preparation. I'm working on it uh, uh, since quite a, quite a long time, uh, and I'm hoping to finish it maybe in, in one or two years. Um, so I, I treat selected parts from this, this collection of two books, uh, arguments I will not be presenting full proofs. I will try to give you intuition as to why the results are true. And then also highlight a little bit of the, uh, the basic ideas behind the proofs. And many of these uh, proofs are, are well, sometimes they're relatively basic. So first and second moment methods, basically Markov's inequality and the Chebyshev inequality. It's, it's amazing how far you can get with just these two very, very basic uh, uh, techniques. But a very profound um, methodology that, that has been uh, flourishing in random graph theory is branching process uh, uh, approximations. So coupling to, uh, couplings to approximate, to approximate local neighborhoods of, branching process, of, of random graphs by uh, branching process equivalents. And the, the formal notion to make this precise is local weak convergence. But you can already understand what happens at a pretty basic uh, heuristic level. And it turns out that the sort of the answers that you get out of those, even though these, these sort of only describe the, the local neighborhoods of random graphs, these answers are often also valid for the global uh, random graph properties. For example, the existence and the size of the giant component you can predict by the local behavior uh, around a, a typical point. So that's the kind of uh, uh, philosophy that I will try to explain. And therefore, it's a particular pleasure to have Krishna Treya in the, uh, in the audience. Of course, he's the, the co-author with Ney of uh, one of the, the most profound books in, in branching processes. And I'm hoping that you, you like the fact that the, the, the area of branching processes has been getting a, a huge impetus from uh, random graph theory. One of the things that we see is that uh, for many of the basic problems that we want to investigate in random graph theory, the whole branching process machinery is there. 
But when you sort of go to slightly more advanced topics, you reach areas in which even the random graph, pro even the branching process problem is not known. So that's actually quite interesting. All right. So the first lecture, real world networks and random graphs. Um, what are we thinking about? Well, we're thinking about complex networks. And complex networks are all around us, as I said. Uh, these are just two pictures uh, taken from the literature. This is from a very famous paper by Barabasi. Barabasi is one of the top people in, uh, in network theory. He's really an applied person with a physics background. He does all sorts of interesting work on applications of random graph theory. Uh, the, 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 the theory is not mathematical. So we tend to call his results physics predictions. We have to be careful there. And sometimes the predictions are wrong, as every prediction is sometimes wrong. And that's actually uh, one of the important uh, contributions that mathemat mathematicians can have, uh, trying to filter out which of the, uh, the, the thoughts that are being produced in the more applied fields are correct and which ones are flawed and how are they flawed. So um, this is a particular example of a yeast protein interaction network. So these are all the, uh, all the proteins that are in an E. coli uh, uh, cell, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and what you see is that all of these little dots are a protein, and you connect two proteins to one another when they are somehow collaborating in, in a reaction. So it could be that one is a catalyst for a reaction that another is involved in. It could be that the two are reacting together to a third. It could be that one is reacting with another to become the second. So all of these edges have some sort of biological meaning. And you can imagine that in order to know which all the edges are, it requires an enormous amount of research in biology. And it's not even clear whether all these edges are complete. Maybe there's actually more there that we actually don't know about yet. But what you see is that this, this is still a relatively small uh, network, but networks can come, become uh, arbitrarily large. Think about Facebook, uh, about a billion people that are connected to one another. That's another example. Right? So you should really think about these networks as being fairly big. A few thousands up to hundreds of millions or even a billion. That's the kind of uh, picture, mental picture that you should have in mind. So it makes perfect sense to be taking large graph limits. That's exactly what people do in random graph theory. Now this is another picture I really like these pictures. They're made uh, uh, by, by an artist. And these are visualizations of the internet. And you have several of them. This is one from 2010. They come in different colors, different colors having different meanings, sometimes referring to geographic locations and so on. But one of the things that you see here, a bit similar to here, is that the thing is fairly complex. Now, what it means for a network to be complex is actually undefined. There's no mathematical uh, definition for this. But what you should really think about uh, is that the network is very big, as I was saying, but also it's fairly inhomogeneous. <coughs> so that means that, that vertices in the network play a completely different role. And that makes perfect sense. You know, one of the examples that may work well with an audience like this is the collaboration graph amongst mathematicians. So you take as your nodes the mathematicians, and you connect two mathematicians to one another when they've collaborated on a paper. So you will see the very senior people who have lots of uh, connections there. Uh, Erdős has the most. He has more than 500 collaborators. That's huge. Um, and the majority of people actually will have very few collaborators. In fact, uh, we've done some, uh, some data analysis with students on the, 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 the network of uh, MathSciNet, which you can do. Uh, there's a free tool in MathSciNet which allows you to uh, trace out uh, distances between nodes. Uh, that basically means a collection of papers to connect one paper to another. The Erdős number is, a, is an example of this. And I've really had to change my mind of, of what it means to be a typical mathematician. If you draw a mathematician uniformly at random, which you can do, because every mathematician has an ID, which is a number of five or six digits. So you can just draw one uniformly at random and check whether that's a, a, a proper mathematician ID. And if it is, then you have a typical person. So I've, I've let my students do this. It's a lot of work, but if you have many students, you can do this. 
And uh, it, really what you see is that sort of the, the prototypical mathematician that is in there probably has degree one, two, three, sometimes even zero. You should really think about a master student writing a paper with his or her supervisor as being the typical mathematician that is present in Mount Sinai, which is not exactly the picture that I had. So it's useful to do data analysis. Um, and, and you know that's what it means to be complex. A huge amount of variability in, for example, the degree structure, but it could even go way further. There could be community structures in these networks and so on. There could be much more complicated features that we're not taking into account. Here in this course, I'll be mainly focusing on the degree distribution and connectivity properties of such networks. Yes? Ah, that, that could also be, and, and in my very last talk, which is more research oriented, I will actually be looking at citation networks, and there the time evolution is actually very important. We'll get to time evolution a little bit, but in one of the par paradigmatic models, uh, which is called the preferential attachment model. Yes, that can be, yes. So we'll, we'll see an example of that form. Yeah, right. So when you yeah. look at the citation data, is anything controversial you can share with us? Or <laughs> yeah, I will, in my fourth, fourth lecture. In the fourth lecture. Yeah, so that there's an extensive data analysis part of that, and I will actually tell you about that. And then also, I mean, this, this data analysis part is also the, the way to come to an idea of a model. And time evolution will be very important there. But usually we'll not be thinking about the time evolution. Usually we'll think about a snapshot of the network and just try to model that. But the, the dynamics are actually very important as well. Good question. So many of these networks come from, come from all sorts of different fields. I was talking about sort of collaboration networks, citation networks, uh, but you can also think about social networks, biological networks, and so on. So you may wonder, I mean, what, what, what the hell can they have in common? Well, as it turns out, these networks, from a sort of a very high level perspective, uh, do share some features. And that's actually been the impetus of, of network science, because it allows us to investigate many of these applications in one go. And that's much more efficient. So what are these unexpected commonalities? Well, the first is this inhomogeneity that I was talking about, and often that is measured in terms of the degree distribution. So the degree distribution, let me write this down on the board because it will play an important role. Sometimes it's indicated as depending on the network size, which will always be taken to be n. And this is just a proportion of vertices in my network of size n. So this is just a set one up to n. The proportion of vertices that have degree k, so oh, this should be dv. This is the degree of vertex v, the number of outgoing edges. In many of my examples, my networks will be undirected, so I can talk about a degree. If they're directed, you should think about in degree and out degree separately, but okay, that creates all sorts of technical problems, but not necessarily any, uh, let's say, paradigmatic problems. So one of the things that you see here is that we're plotting these degree distributions in log-log scale. Um, and that actually means that uh, these proportions are exponentially decreasing along the axis, whereas the uh, values, meaning the degrees, are exponentially increasing. So we're basically plotting the log of this object versus the log of k. That's what we're doing. And what you often see is a, a point cloud such as this one. So this is for the in-degree distribution of web crawls. So this is a, a, a part of the internet, a part of the World Wide Web. And what you see is that this point cloud generally starts out relatively smoothly, and then it sort of opens up like this. And this is very similar to what you would get if you were to take uh, counts of an IID distribution and frequencies, um, because you have this maximum value that appears somewhere here. In this case, it's something like 10 to the power of 5. It means that the maximum degree found here is 10 to the power of 5, which is pretty humongous. Um, and that's why this somehow this, this becomes relatively broad. The, the stripes you get because there's many vertices that have a unique degree. So they are the only vertex that has that degree. And then it means that you have one dot, and here the network size is something like 10 to the power, uh, 10 to the power of 6, so the proportion is something like 10 to the power of minus 6. Okay? 
Um, this is a, a, a smoothed out version. I got this one from uh, Dima Kriukov, who is a, a very good physicist working in the area. And what they tend to do is they tend to bin these, these pictures to make them a little bit more smooth. And that's what you see here. So this is the degree distribution of the autonomous systems in the internet. Now one of the things that you may notice, certainly when you squeeze your eyes a little bit shut, is that uh, you have sort of straight line-ish parts here, both here as well as here. And a perfect straight line would correspond to something which is called a power law, so a heavy-tailed random variable. And then such a power law, is uh, it, its, its characteristics are governed by an exponent, which I will denote by tau. And it basically, this tau indicates how many moments the distribution will have. So if tau is larger, tau needs to be larger than one, otherwise this is not summable. If tau is in between uh, uh, one and two, you have infinite mean random variables. If tau is in between two and three, you have finite mean but infinite variance random variables. If tau is larger than three, then you have finite variance random variables. But still, these are very heavy-tailed. It actually means that if I were to draw n random variables in an IID way from a distribution like that, then actually the maximum degree will scale like a power of n, the maximum value. And that's somehow what you tend to be seeing here, these very high values. Okay? And the empirical evidence, and there's lots of empirical evidence, because basically any data set that you can have that is interesting about a network, you can write a paper about, and that's actually what is happening. Um, and the empirical evidence tries to estimate this tall. That's already a whole chapter by itself. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. That's a very difficult statistical question, but okay. Um, in any case, the empirical evidence often a tall in between two and three is reported. And for us, probabilists, this is quite uh, good to hear because this actually is an interesting phenomenon. It basically means that the degree distribution has finite mean, but infinite variance. So what does this mean? And we've already heard uh, Kavita talk about sparse versus dense. Um, and this is very relevant. So what I call sparse, and there are some, uh, uh, there are different notions as well, but what I call sparse is that the average degree remains bounded. So the average degree is something like 1 over n sum of the degree. Okay? And bear in mind, what we're always doing here is taking a large graph limit, and then I'll be assuming that this remains bounded as n tends to infinity, so it doesn't grow. This is, of course, always bounded in a finite network. The dense setting would correspond to a setting where this would grow like n, as large it is, as it can be. The sparse setting is the setting where this remains bounded as small as it can be to be still interesting. Now there's some confusion because there's a whole community working on dense graphs, there's a whole community working on sparse graphs, and they don't always agree as to what dense and sparse is. So the dense community will call anything where the average degree is slower than n sparse, and the sparse uh, sort of community will call anything where the average degree tends to infinity dense. You have to be a little bit careful in interpreting dense and sparse. There's two regimes where everybody agrees. The proper dense setting, where degrees grow like n, and the proper sparse setting, where the degrees, the average degree remains bounded. And that's the setting that I will be in, even though the other settings are very interesting as well. But from a practical perspective, that's the, uh, the, the, the sparse setting, the proper sparse setting is really the area um, that, that is the most uh, prominent, because what we see in our, our networks is that generally the, the average degree is not very large. Think about five or six. All right. So that's one thing that many of these networks have in common. Power law degree sequences or scale-free behavior. The second thing is a small world phenomenon. And that basically means that if I were to pick two individuals uniformly at random from my network, and let's just assume that they are connected. And you can look at the shortest path between the two vertices. And that number tends to be very small. So one way of doing that is by just taking all possible pairs, well, connected pairs, and computing the graph distance between them. And that's a random variable, even in a sort of a, a network data set. Uh, and then plotting the, the, the histogram of that, so the probability mass function. And if you do that, you get pictures such as this one. 
So this is for the strongly connected component in the World Wide Web, and this is for the Internet Movie Database. That's basically your collaboration graph, very alike uh, the, the MathSciNet uh, collaboration graph, but then for, uh, for actors. So what you see here is that both in the World Wide Web as well as in the Internet Movie Database, even though these networks are very big, you should think about a million actors or so here. Uh, I don't remember how large the, the size of the strongly connected component was, but these generally are pretty big, yet these distances remain fairly small. Eight, nine, ten is the most that you see. That's of course not the diameter because actually these proportions are very small, so there could be a value very far away here that still has positive mass. So it could be that the diameter of the graph is actually fairly substantial, even though the typical distances are not. Okay? This is called the small world paradigm, and it's closely related to six degrees of separation. And this is sort of the urban myth that says that if you pick two, uni two, ver two people on this planet, irrespective of how you pick them, you can find a trail of friends, whatever friends mean, because that's not a so such a clear notion, uh, that links the two with at most six intermediaries. So they would say that the graph distances are at most seven. Okay? And that's the kind of phenomenon that we would like to understand. And mathematical modeling can help there. Because what we see is that we have a huge network, think in terms of millions, and we see that graph distances are still fairly small, seven, eight, nine, typically. Why? Not so obvious. All right. So, a little bit about the philosophy of network science. So, there is a whole community working on, on this from various disciplines. Think about neuroscience, social science, uh, bibliometry, uh, which is the, 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 uh, the field studying science and, and publications and so on, and, and lots more. And uh, what we generally do is we, we look at our complex networks and we model it using a random graph. And the reason for that is that we see that these connections are very spurious and very sort of, unpredictable. It's very dif difficult to give a deterministic framework for what such a model could look like. Also, this sort of adheres to the general philosophy of complexity. I mean, how should you model complex systems? Well, that's very difficult because typically all the agents, and you may have many of them, they may take different choices of what they could do. And a very good and convenient way of modeling this is using probability theory. So I'm not touching upon the philosophical aspects as to whether the internet is a random graph. In fact, that was my very first experience in submitting a paper in the area where the referee report was one line saying the internet is not a random graph, paper rejected. So, I mean, it's, it's not about that. The internet probably is not a random graph, even though you may wonder whether, let's say, a stochastic way of looking at it may be more fruitful than a deterministic way of looking at it. Okay, um, so that's, that's about sort of the models for a network. But then we're often interested in, in all sorts of things that may act upon the network, right? So, uh, for example, in the World Wide Web, you may actually be interested in ranking web pages. That's what PageRank does. But in social networks, you may be interested in how ideas flow through the network or how a disease flows through the network. Um, you may be interested in how robust the networks are to failures. So if, if many of my nodes drop out for one reason or another, does that somehow cascade through the system or does it stay localized? Okay. So these are all different kind of processes that could act on the network. And I'll be talking about information diffusion just to give an example, but there's a whole sort of uh, whole communities thinking about uh, also the spread of diseases, epidem epidemiology, uh, but also how about synchronization. So if you have some processes acting on the network, will they synchronize or not? So this is a way to understand why the chirping of cr crickets actually does synchronize in the real world. We see that happening. Um, also, algorithms on, the, on networks are very important. You can think about page rank, but also there is a way of trying to classify what the, the, the correlation structure is between degrees on either side of an edge. That's called assortativity. Uh, you can think about the community structure and detecting communities and so on. Um, and I believe that this whole area will be a prominent uh, part of applied math for certainly two decades to come. So there's a lot of interesting problems left there, and we're constantly fed interesting novel problems from practitioners who actually would like to understand 
what the things are that they see in the real world. All right. So what are the, uh, the, the models for complex networks? What do they look like? Well, you can sort of divide, divide them up into several different branches, and, and there's many, 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 many more models, and I will say a little bit about that uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, but the, the, the general um, division is uh, the division in terms of inhomogeneous random graphs, configuration model type networks, and preferential attachment models. And let me try to explain what this is. So the inhomogeneous random graph is a model for a static random graph, so you fix the network size once and for all. And now you're going to decide how people are connected to one another. And these connections are independent, but not necessarily identically distributed. So it could be that you somehow want to model in some inhomogeneity in your network, and therefore some vertices are likely to have more edges than other vertices. That's allowed, but the edges are still independent. That's the first class of models in homogeneous random graphs, and I'll say much more about that uh, uh, later on. Uh, these are inhomogeneous extensions to the erdos renyi random graph. Who has not heard of the erdos renyi random graph ever? Very good. Um, the configuration model is, a, is a, a quite different model. It's sort of inspired by the idea that um, the degree structure plays a very profound role. So what you would maybe like to do is Sort of look at a real world network, it has a certain degree distribution. Does it look, does that network look typical? Does it have more triangles than a typical graph with the same degree structure, for example? Now, how would you do that? Well, I mean, one way to do that is to draw one graph uniformly at random from the whole collection of graphs with the same degrees, identically the same degrees. That's sometimes called the null model and then compare whatever network characteristic that you're interested in, in the random graph, compared to the real world network. And that allows you to give a qualified answer to the statement that the network has more triangles than you would imagine, or has a stronger community structure, or whatever, right? Of course, this is a difficult problem. I mean, how the hell are you going to draw a, a graph uniformly at random from a collection of graphs with a given degree distribution? We don't even know how many there are. So drawing one uniformly at random is not easy. And the configuration model is a fix around this. It's one way of thinking that it allows you to actually do it, draw one uniformly at random. You could also say that it sort of, it removes some of the more technical properties, problems around drawing one uniformly at random, and it, it produces a graph that basically has the same degree distribution. And I'll say much more about that uh, uh, later on. And the third model is sort of going in the direction of uh, Krishna's question, a very, very uh, natural question. Um, many times these networks actually are being produced dynamically. So in Facebook, people come in every now and then, and then they decide to connect up. I mean, can you devise very simple laws about how they are connecting to the vertices that are already there that will tell you something about the structure? of the network. And preferential attachment is a way of doing that, and the whole philosophy is that if a new newcomer comes to town, he or she is more likely to, to meet the people that are socially active, and the people who are socially active probably have a higher degree. So you're trying to give a preference towards vertices that have a high degree. And that's a very simple mechanism, yet it gives the kind of random graphs or the kind of realizations of graphs that have power law degree distributions. I'll say more about that later on, as I said. Well, that depends on what kind of a degree you're looking at. Are you looking at, let's say, the degree of a uniform individual? No. If you're looking at the degree of the original root, or the second vertex, or the third vertex, yes. Right? So, if you're talking about the degree of a vertex, how are we, how are we choosing the vertex? That's an important question, precisely. So the newcomer is going to have a bounded degree, but the original root of the whole thing is going to have a degree that tends to infinity. So the, the, the degrees of, let's say, the early vertices will grow, but the average degree over the whole network will not. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. But I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, uh, later on. Now, of course, these are three different ways of looking at the real world. 
if you come up with three models for the real world, you're basically thinking about the same thing, do they give similar predictions? If they don't, you're in trouble. Right? If physicist A comes up with a model for gravity that says something and, and physicist B says, gives another model that says something else, well, then you can devise an experiment to check who's right. Now, here you can't. There's no experiment that you can do. So what you would hope instead is that the, the type of models that you're interested in, the type of models that you're going to be studying, are going to be predicting roughly the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at things. And this is something which might be called universality for a physicist. Uh, universality basically says that the, the governing laws of, of your whole system depend on some peculiarities of, of the, the model, but not on all of the specific details. Yes. Two answers. First of all, we see a high amount of variability, and power laws are a way to think about that. The second thing is that the applied community doesn't agree and doesn't see eye to eye about this question, this particular question. This year, a paper was published uh, with the title, Scale-Free Networks Are Rare. This is Broido and, and Clausette, that's probably the one that you're referring to. We have a reply to this. Scale-free networks, well done. Um, that's a bit of a pun, going to stakes, but never mind. Um, it's not so clear. It's not clear. Okay. It's not clear. The assumption makes sense. Yes, and it's still true that the applied community tends to say that power laws are there and that the power law exponents are in between two and three. We don't know. Okay. I mean, the best as a mathematician you can do is assume whether it's true and see what the consequences would be. And that's typically what we do. But to a, as a more proper answer to your question, what you in general want to do is understand very carefully what the exact role of the degree distribution is. And that's what I'll be talking about. So if you want to reinterpret it that way, that's perfectly fine. So I will, will be allowing for very general degree distributions, including the power law ones, but also including all sorts of other ones, log normal or whatever. It turns out that there's only different behavior if you're assuming a power law, and then there's different regimes for the power law exponent, and all the thinner tails are basically the same. And typically, the same means after some specific finite threshold of the power law exponent tall that you can identify. That's sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes five, depending on the precise problem that you're interested in. That's a, a bit more detailed answer to your question. It's a very good question. And the answer to this is not Done yet, I would say. But I'll get back to that. All right. So let me start by giving the simplest possible model. This is the erdos random graph. And there, what we do is we just take n vertices here, 1 up to n. And I'll denote them by, by this n with square brackets, just, I was, just like what I was doing over there. And then it means that we have n choose two possible edges connecting the two. I'm, I'm looking at a, an undirected version. And we'll assume that each of these edges is occupied independently with probability p. Now, if p would be independent of n, then the expected degree would grow like n times p. In fact, that's always true. Um, and then so the degrees would blow up, and that's a jet, the dense setting. Okay? Instead, we're looking at the sparse setting. So we'll choose p to be of the order lambda over n. Okay, and then it means that the average degree will be roughly lambda. And then we'll keep lambda fixed and send n to infinity. That's the game that we'll play. Now, of course, you could also interpret this as a dynamical model, but that construction is a little bit awkward. Because not only should you add vertices and edges of them, but you should also be thinning the edges that are there, because somehow the edge probabilities are decaying. Possible, but maybe not so natural. All right, now that's one problem, but the second problem is that this, this whole model is totally egalitarian, in the sense that every vertex, basically, its degree distribution will be totally the same. And in fact, that is being reflected by the fact that the degree distribution in such a network is Poissonian. And Poisson distribution has an extremely thin tail, thinner than exponential. So that actually means that you're not going to see this, this uh, uh, inhomogeneity that we see in the network. Basically, the maximum degree will be something like n, uh, log n over log log n, which is fairly small. And if I, even if I do this for a network of size a billion, log n over log log n is not going to be that large. And in real-world networks, we really see degrees that are much larger than that. So that means that this is not quite a good model. Okay? 
So that basically means that we have to get rid of some of our assumptions. Well, we've made two assumptions, the independence of the edges and the fixed probability. So we'll, we'll actually be taking both away at some point or another, but let's start with the first one, namely the, prob the, the fact that the, the edge probabilities are the same. And then we run into the area of inhomogeneous random graphs. Edge probability of edges are still independent random variables, but the edge probabilities are different across the pairs of individuals. There's a whole literature about this. Uh, the most general results are by Bolovas, Janssen, and Reardon. They've written a 120-page paper, it's sort of a book, in which they analyze all sorts of properties of uh, such networks in, in full generality. It's a beautiful paper, but it's long. Um, we focus on a specific, uh, particular version of it, which is called the generalized random graph, and I have very good reasons why we want to uh, look at this particular version. So what is this generalized random graph? Well, what you should uh, bear in mind is that every vertex comes in with a certain weight. So the weight of vertex i is wi. Okay, so that means that we have weights w1 up to wn, and these govern the inhomogeneity present in my network. A vertex with very high weight is bound to have many more edges and therefore a higher degree. Vertices with small weights are going to have very small degree. And then what we do is all the edges are still going to be independent, but um, the edge probability, so this is the probability that there's an edge between i and j, are going to be moderated by these weights. So they are of the form wi times wj divided by the sum of all the weights, this, that's this ln, plus wi wj. That's how they're chosen. And there's a specific reason why they're chosen this way. This is sometimes related to odds ratios. And it actually turns out that this, this model therefore has some beautiful properties. Now, of course, we retrieve the erdos random random graph when, with uh, p being lambda over n when you take all these wi's to be, well, basically lambda. Not quite lambda, but almost. There are many related uh, models that have been studied by Chung and Lu, for example. They've, rather than this, taken uh, the product of the weights divided by ln, but that could be larger than one, and therefore you take the minimum with one. That's another alternative. Um, there is a paper by uh, uh, and Reitu, uh, to Finnish uh, probabilists, and they instead take pij to be one minus e to the power minus wi wj over ln. You should bear in mind that ln grows like n, and the wi's and the wj's on average are going to be bounded. So that actually means that on average these p's are like 1 over n, just like in the erdos renyi random graph, but there may be huge variabilities, particularly for vertices for which the weights are very large. Okay? But you should bear in mind that this, that this ratio here, the ratio that we see over here, generally is quite small. And one thing you can notice is that if you do perform a linear Taylor expansion of these three functions as a function of wi, wj over ln, the leading order coefficient is the same. It actually means that these models, you should really think of them as being very similar, except when wi, wj over ln is quite large. And this is possible. Okay? And there is a beautiful paper by Svante Janssen who actually gives general conditions for as asymptotic equivalence of these three models. And asymptotic equivalence in this case really means that you can couple the two graphs in such a way that all the edges are the same. But we'll often be interested in sort of equivalence relations that are much weaker. For example, that they have the same limiting degree distribution or something like that. And that will occur much more quickly. All right. I mean, the only thing you can do is, is well, assume that it's true or not. Uh, you need to have other reasons why you would believe that things such as this are true or not. Um, and not, not necessarily, uh, uh, I think a testing framework is going to be very difficult. Goodness of fit. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, small networks, and certainly when you have several replications, then it becomes almost classical statistics. But this is, this is generally not classical statistics in the sense that you do have a lot of data, but you only have one realization of the network. Right? So it's a, it's a slightly different setting. But in fact, statistical problems on networks are very interesting. Um, I will not touch upon this. Did I answer your question or? Okay, yes. Very good question. This is uh, the next uh, uh, point on the agenda. So 
Of course, I mean, I was saying that these WIs moderate the, uh, the degrees. And in fact, the interpretation is that this WI is very close to the expected degree of vertex I. So that's what you should think about. Uh, so a vertex with very high weight is going to have, at least in expectation, a very high degree. That's what you should be thinking about. But of course, we haven't said anything about what these WIs are going to be. Now, one thing you could do is just draw them IID. That's perfectly fine. That's an example that works. We generally want to do this a little bit more generally. And that's what this says. And it basically says that we want the empirical distribution of them to converge. Of course, empirical distributions come up a lot in statistics and so on. I tend to think about these weights as being a deterministic sequence. But still, I can then talk about the empirical distribution of that deterministic system, this deterministic sequence to converge. That's what this says. So this is the empirical distribution. We're assuming that this empirical distribution converges. That's the same thing as saying that if I were to draw a, a, a random variable with that distribution function, that that converges in distribution to some limiting value. So this in particular says, so if, you, if you think about it carefully, what this random variable is, is exactly the weight of a uniformly chosen individual in the network. That's what this random variable is. So it says that if I draw a vertex uniformly at random, inspect its weight, and this is roughly going to be some limiting degree distribution, limiting weight distribution. And what, oh, so I'm sorry, I'm not so well acquainted with the theory of agents. I just think of it as being an inherent property of the individual. Let's say it's sociability. If a person who is very sociable will have many friends. And therefore, he, he or she will have a high weight. Yeah? So that's not the only thing that we, we need. We often also want that the, the, average, the average weight converges to the expectation of this variable. So this is really what it means to be sparse. Okay? And in some cases, we actually also need the second moment to converge. Uh, that will become clear when it, when it comes up. So this is really saying that it's sparse. This is somehow saying that the graph is regular. Actually, you know, it doesn't say that much. Because if you were to assume, let's say, something like uh, uh, this average being bounded, so rather than this, but then with, uh, with the weights, uh, and suppose that you were to assume that it's uniformly integrable, then you can extract the subsequence along which you have convergence and et cetera, et cetera. So um, you could also think of this as being a theory along subsequences, if you wish. But I prefer to think about my networks as being fairly regular, and then this is a very natural assumption to be making. Okay? So, as I was trying to say, we're, we're often interested in the degree structure. Now we have a random graph. We know how many edges. Well, we know what the edge probabilities are. What is then the degree structure of my graph? Uh, well, what we would like to have, I mean, looking back at the pictures that we were seeing for these real world networks, what we would like to have is a setting where the degree distribution has some sort of an asymptotic shape as n tends to infinity. And maybe you would also like to say something about maximum degrees or so. All right, so in particular, we want some degree regularity. And it means that, you know, if I look at the number of vertices with a given degree, that should be close to some limiting degree distribution, capital D in this case. And the question is uh, what that D would be. We'll get back to that. But also the question is how you should take your Ws uh, in such a way that this will occur. So an IAD sequence will work. Um, and uh, um, another version that you could take, which is totally deterministic, is you, you take some distribution function, you look at the inverse of one minus it, and then you substitute in i over n for different values of i. This will actually be uh, you know, sort of a very good approximation. The empirical degree distribution will be a very good approximation of uh, the, the random variable that has distribution 1 minus uh, f inverse of a uniform, and that actually has distribution function f. That's pretty classical. Um, and of course, if we're thinking about power laws, one thing you could do is take a distribution function that is decaying like a power, so this is, this is the distribution function. So if we look at the derivative, that is going to be the density. And the density here will decay like 1 over x to the power tau. And then you can compute this. And you get that these weights have this funny shape where you see an n over j appearing. The typical j's are of order n. So this is typically uh, a fixed number. 
and then you have this funny power, one over tau minus one, and it basically means that the largest weight in your network will grow like a power of n. Since the weight is going to be very close to the expected degree, it means that you're going to have degree distributions that have maximum degree that grow like a power of n. Just like the maximum of n IID random variables with a parallel tail grows like n to the power one over tau minus one as well. Okay, so, but this is a deterministic version of this. So that's the kind of weights that you should be thinking about. Sort of a nicely regular, but possibly highly inhomogeneous. All right. Now, what is then the degree structure? So, as I was doing here, I'm looking at the empirical distribution of the degrees. Bear in mind, these degrees are not independent random variables, they're dependent. And I'm just looking at how many vertices, or what is the proportion of vertices that have degree exactly equal to k in my network. Okay? And it turns out that this random variable, in fact, it's a random probability distribution, converges in distribution to a deterministic limit, and this deterministic limit turns out to take this shape, where this w variable is exactly the w variable that we see appearing here. All right? And if you look at the, the, the shape of this, if the w's would just be lambdas, we would see a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. <clears throat> now we see a Poisson distribution with a random parameter, and that's sometimes called a mixed Poisson distribution. And somehow the, the philosophy behind this should be that if I pick a vertex uniformly at random, then its weight is going to have distribution exactly this Wn, and therefore it's going to be in distribution very close to W. But once I fix it, I know that the expected degree is going to be this exact same W. So I have lots of independent indicators coming out of it whose sort of success probabilities, they're all independent, and the success probabilities sum up to this W variable. Well, we all know that sums of independent indicators with small success probabilities are going to converge to a Poisson. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, intuition behind this, and this can be made precise in this pretty strong sense. Okay, so this limit is the probability mass function of a Poisson random variable with a random parameter W, which has distribution function F, and that actually means that if you want to think about the properties of this object, for example, when does it obey a power law? So it obeys a power law when, let's say, the probability that this the random variable with this probability mass function is larger than k decays like 1 over k to a, a power tau minus 1. And that's going to occur if and only if actually the w satisfies the same thing. And the reason for that is that if I take a Poisson variable with a very large parameter, it's going to be extremely closely concentrated around that value. So in order to have a very large value in such a mixed Poisson distribution, the only way to achieve that is that your random parameter is very big. Okay, so we get power law degrees precisely when we have power law weights. That's pretty natural. All right. I will not describe it for this particular model. I'll focus on the configuration model, but we, I can explain offline how this works. Yeah. All right. So that was my first model. Today I'm going to be discussing two models, tomorrow a third. Second model is the configuration model. And the configuration model has a long history. It's, it's an example of what is sometimes called the probabilistic method. And in the probabilistic method, you use probabilistic ideas in order to derive something which is totally deterministic. And the thing that is totally deterministic that people use the configuration model for is exactly to count how many graphs there are with specific degrees. So you fix degrees d1 up to dn, and now you want to compute, let's say to leading order asymptotics, how many graphs there are with those degrees. That's a non-trivial problem. And it has attracted a lot of attention. And the configuration model is a very simple way of doing it. And I'll explain that in more detail tomorrow, in, 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 in mathematical detail, how that can be done. Uh, but let me now uh, uh, just describe what the model is. So the model comes in with n vertices, just like the inhomogeneous random graphs that I was talking about before. So it's a static picture, n is fixed once and for all. And for each of the vertices, we know exactly what the degrees are. D1 up to Dn, they could be taken to be IID, but they could also be something else, whatever you wish to have. Um, they could even be taken to be constant, all five. And then you get something which is called the five regular random graph. That's actually also an interesting model to be looking at. Um, but because of the inhomogeneity that we see in our real-world networks, we're again going to be 
giving special attention to power law degrees. So settings where, let's say, the proportion of vertices decays like an inverse power of k. If they're IID, that's the same thing as saying that the probability that the first one is greater than or equal to k decays like an inverse power of k. All right? So if you were to do this, just a, a picture, this is just a picture for an IID sample where I plot it in a log-log shape, just like I was doing for the uh, degree structures in, in, uh, in the uh, network models. Um, here I'm not uh, taking proportions, but that doesn't matter. Um, and here is a million, and what I drew, do is I plot the log-log uh, degree distribution of this sample of IID random variables. And one of the things that you see is that this picture looks a lot like the real world pictures that we were seeing here. Again, you see this sort of tapered off thing. It's, it's a bit of a cone like that. And uh, uh, what you see is that the behavior here comes from stochastic fluctuations. So that's exactly what you see here. Also, again, here you see a pretty straight line-ish part, and then here it sort of shapes off like a cone. So indeed, these are relatively similar compared to the uh, uh, network data set that we've seen. Just to understand what the, yes. what the picture, because you keep coming back to that picture, but yeah. it struck my attention that they actually the slope is getting more negative and more negative. So it's like there is conflict. Is it? Not on this one, in the previous one, the one that... Uh, Sometimes, yeah. Okay. So there's a whole theory about what the degree structure could be. And uh, in some cases, people are saying that it sort of tapers off slightly more quickly. And this is being modeled by a, a power law because it's straight line is in the beginning with an exponential cutoff. And it's not even clear how that should be modeled. Um, my approach to this would be to say, you know, in the beginning, it, it does look like a proper power law and later on it tapers off. And in the large graph limit, this means that the tapering off occurs at a value that actually grows with the network size. But that, again, that's a mathematical model. But it's a very good question. And the effects of this are not at all clear. Right? For example, for graph distances or so on, it's not clear what the effect is. Now all of a sudden you have a degree distribution that depends on n in, a, in an intricate way. Yeah. Right? Good question. Well, this is the construction in words, and I would actually like to instead show it in an animation. So this is a, a, a project, an outreach project that we've done in uh, a, a large research network that we've built up in the Netherlands. It's called the Network Pages. And on the Network Pages you can find all sorts of um, articles about topics that occur uh, that we find interesting and that are related to networks. So synchronization in the body clock is an example. Um, the relation between bitcoins and queues, which you may be interested in. Who sits where in the Senate? Uh, what is the positioning of the different factions in the, in, in the Senate, and so on. So there's lots of articles there written by mathematicians just like me, uh, which is actually not very easy, um, but, uh, but it's a lot of fun too. Now also, uh, a postdoc who is working on this has made lots of simulations and animations of many of the models that people have been interested in, uh, including the configuration model. All right, so this is the animation. Ah, this doesn't have the... Uh, this, okay. So here we see the number of vertices, which is 30. It also has a display speed, and I have to stop. So I, I, I will stop uh, very, very shortly. I just want to explain this uh, simulation. What you see is that these vertices come in with a little thing coming out of it. We call these half edges. And every vertex has a number of half edges that is equal to its degree. And then what you do is you pair the half edges one by one, uniformly at random. So I pick a first half edge, I pair it to another half edge that I draw from all the other ones uniformly at random. Two half edges together form an edge, they're removed, and then I take a next half edge that has not been paired yet. And let me do this again on a sample size of size 40, uh, 50. Okay, so you see all the little stubs there. They're being paired one by one in a random order. In fact, you could even do it clockwise or anti-clockwise or whichever way you do. 
we pair them all together, and then of course we get something that doesn't look like a, a regular network as we usually draw it, and then it's being laid out in a slightly different way, and this is called the force field layout. Somehow you minimize, you think about all the edges as being uh, uh, springs, and you try to minimize the, the energy. And one thing that you see is that every once in a while, the, uh, uh, the pairing will be such that you create a little bit of a problem. Because most of the networks that we generally see in, in the real world, they're simple networks, meaning that there are no self-loops and no multiple edges. In this case, we have one multiple edge here. And if you do it again, sometimes you will see, let's just do it again, uh, for 51. Okay. If you do it again, every once in a while you'll see that there may be one self-loop. Sometimes there's two self-loops, sometimes there's two multiple edges, sometimes there's none of each. Okay? That's the model. It's very flexible in terms of the degree structure, and that's what it does. So here I'm taking a degree distribution that is uniform between one and five. But in general, I'm not assuming that at all. I'll actually come back to that tomorrow, my time is up. And then I will talk in, in more detail about the precise degree structure that we'll be assuming, but that will be very closely related to the weight assumption that I was making for the generalized random graph. Any further questions? Thank you very much.